Hi everyone, I'm Ann Williams of CEDL, or SEDL, in Austin, Texas, and I'll be introducing today's webcast entitled Vocational Rehabilitation Counselors, Use of Evidence-Based Practices Involving Motivational Interviewing. The webcast is offered through the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDR. Before we introduce today's speakers, I'd like to turn to Cindy Kai to give an overview of today's webcast and how this webcast, the second in a series, fits into a broader context for knowledge translation from rehabilitation research to vocational rehabilitation service delivery. Cindy? Thanks so much, Ann. Hi, I am Cindy Kai from the American Institute for Research, AIR. I managed a subgrant between AIR and CEDL to develop a series of webcasts and to establish a community of practice to help promote the understanding and use of evidence-based practices in the field of vocational rehabilitation, or VR. My colleagues, Jerry Mendes and Mahi Magra, have been instrumental in the development of this webcast and related community of practice. In the past webcast, we discussed the issues surrounding the use of practice guidelines in the R. The second webcast will follow the same thread of the relationship between research and practice, where we'll have a dialogue to examine how the R has been informed by an evidence-based practice, motivational interviewing, or MI, and how practice guidelines can be useful in implementing MI in VR service delivery. In our dialogue today, we will discuss four central questions. What is motivational interviewing and is evidence-based? How has MI been used in VR? What is the evidence to demonstrate the effectiveness of motivational interviewing in VR service delivery? And what is the role of practice guidelines in the use of MI in VR? Here's our agenda for today. After my overview of the webcast topic, we will introduce our presenters and have a facilitated discussion. We'll then wrap up by letting you know how you can become part of this discussion. Now I am going to turn to my colleague, Jerry Mendes, AIR Managing Project Specialist, who will introduce the speakers and facilitate today's webcast. Jerry? Um, thank you, Cindy and Ann. Let's start by providing some context that led to the selection of our panelists. In recent years, MI has been adapted for use by VR counselors in a number of states. The NIDR-funded Research and Training Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison has conducted research on the application of MI to the VR system and has worked closely with the TASE Center for Region 5 in translating this evidence to practice through the training of VR counselors. Participants in the webcast include Dr. Tim Tanzi, who is the Associate Director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Evidence-Based VR Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. Tim has over 15 years of experience in rehabilitation and has been involved in MI research related to VR. Christine Johnson is a program manager with the Region 5 Taste Center at the Southern Illinois University Carbondale and has over 25 years of experience. JoLynn Blazer is the Staff Development Director for Minnesota Vocational Rehabilitation Services, has over 30 years of experience and has been guiding a major effort in Minnesota to develop VR staff competencies in MI. Kay Lechner is a Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor with the Wisconsin Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. She will share her experience in applying MI and with VR counselors, including her role as a coach of other VR staff in MI practices. Our first speaker is Dr. Tanzi, who will give a background on what is motivational interview, interviewing on MI research outside of VR and how that research supports its use in VR. He'll also discuss the research he is currently involved in on the application of MI within VR. Tim? Well, thank you for that introduction, Jerry. 
Uh, motivational interviewing at its root is considered a client-centered, directive, non-confrontational counseling approach designed to enhance motivation for change by exploring and resolving ambivalence. MI was initially designed uh, specifically to treat alcohol-related problems, generally in adolescent and young adults, and was considered an alternative to the confrontational and coercive approaches prevalent in the substance abuse field at the time. Since its inception in 1983, uh, William Miller and Stephen Rolnick have written several books articulating the progression of motivational interviewing as an intervention over time. Their first book describes motivational interviewing as a way to help people resolve their ambivalence with regard to substance abuse specifically. The second book is focused on how to help people resolve ambivalence and move towards change in a broad variety of settings. And their third book, published in 2013, describes new skills and processes developed with, within motivational interviewing based on contemporary research and theory. Ultimately, motivational interviewing should be considered a way to assist individuals to resolve their internal ambivalence about change by facilitating a strategic conversation in which people articulate and hear their own desires, abilities, reasons, and needs for change. Hearing their own reasons for change increases individuals' motivation and commitment for change and ultimately leads to individuals deciding to make positive behavioral changes on their own. The counselor ultimately avoids confrontation or coercion while helping individuals take ownership of their own change process. To that end, motivational interviewing has been applied to a wide range of health behavioral issues. Get what is the eff efficacy of motivational interviewing, and not just looking at the VR system, but really what research has been done in a much broader context. And extensive research has been conducted on the impact of motivational interviewing specifically looking at positive behavioral change. Several meta-analyses of motivational interviewing studies have, have been done, and these typically have supported its use for eliciting that behavioral change for individuals with issues related to substance abuse, as well as mental health, health promotion, and treatment adherence. These empirical studies also suggest that motivational interviewing approaches are not necessarily more effective than other psychosocial interventions, but that motivational interviewing yields comparable results in shorter treatment periods and is appropriate for a broad range of populations and issues. Thus, motivational approaches have been successfully adapted in order to fit a brief intervention model that is critical to modern counseling practice in rehabilitation settings. Next slide. So in thinking about motivational interviewing and then extrapolating that more towards what is the use of this technique, what is the use of this theory within vocational rehabilitation, generally there's been an identified need to expand the use of evidence-based practices within rehabilitation counseling, and motivational interviewing has been recognized as one of these practices. Motivational interviewing is often compared to the trans-theoretical or stages of change model due to its emphasis on addressing motivation early in the pre-contemplation and contemplation stages of the behavioral ch change process. However, we should not confuse motivational interviewing as being identical or mimicking trans-theoretical models. Rather, it is a separate, unique model that highlights very different approaches as far as how behavioral change occurs. Specifically, motivational interviewing can be effective in improving the outcomes in VR programs by maneuvering work barriers and highlighting career values. Rehabilitation clients may perceive barriers when they negatively view outcomes that are consequences to finding employment, such as workplace discrimination. However, certain career-related outcomes, such as contributing to society, may hold positive value for clients. Motivational interviewing can provide useful techniques to help individuals when exploring and making career choices. For example, when developing discrepancy during the motivational interviewing process, rehabilitation counselors can help clients to outline the pros and cons of career decisions. 
They can assist in comparing positive and negative outcome expectations and ultimately facilitate making career choices. Even though studies have yet examined the effectiveness of MI in vocational rehabilitation settings, researchers postulate that it might be a useful approach for increasing motivation related to finding and maintaining employment. <clears throat> Specifically, Wagner and McMahon identified several rehabilitation contexts where motivation interviewing might be appropriate, including managing medical issues and adjusting to physical disability, cognitive impairment, improving psychosocial functioning, and ultimately returning to work. Next slide. The Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Evidence-Based Practices and Vocational Rehabilitation is interested in looking at specific applications of motivational interviewing in vocational rehabilitation service delivery. Specifically, several of our studies out that are ongoing at this point in time are looking at motivational interviewing on VR outcomes of subpopulations with the lowest employment outcomes. And this is a randomized control study that's currently going on. The focus of this study is to provide a curriculum-based intervention to improve readiness to engage in VR services. Specific outcome measures in this study are the focus on vocational self-efficacy, the Working Alliance, and changes to the core self-evaluation. The specific emphasis on the core self-evaluation derives from the four personality dimensions of which the CSC is based upon, which are self-efficacy, self-esteem, locus of control, and neuroticism. This project is designed to create a group-based curriculum for counselor use in working with a population of individuals at early in their rehabilitation planning sessions with a goal of increasing focus within the VR process, increasing overall goal determination of individuals with disabilities, and ultimately improving motivation to change of individuals towards that engagement in the VR process. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, what you've described, I think, is very relevant to our topic today and the topic of this series of webinars is looking at evidence-based practice, how evidence can be used to shape vocational rehabilitation practices. Now that we've had the research perspective, we'll hear about how a technical assistance and continuing education center became involved in applying research on MI for VR agencies and counselors what VR practices that MI is trying to influence, and how MI approaches are being used to train counselors. Now we will hear from Christine Johnson, Program Manager from TACE Region 5. Christine. Thank you, Jerry. Um, when the TACE Center began in 2008, uh, our director, David Adams, met with myself and my coworker, Linda Hedenblad, to look at um, going forth with this new TACE Center, what we might be looking at as far as training and technical assistance um, and best practices that would benefit state VR agencies. In looking at what had been done in the past, um, my coworker Linda had been doing uh, what's called solution-focused training for state agencies. And she discovered that after reading Miller and Rolnick's book on the use of motivational interviewing, she said, this is the way to go, and started to uh, look at training state agencies in the use of motivational interviewing. I had come from the state of Maryland where the, uh, the use of motivational interviewing in the application of uh, evidence-based practice supported employment, or now termed um, IPS, Individual Placement and Support Model, working with individuals with mental illness, um, was increasingly being used and I, I just saw it as a perfect fit for VR settings. Uh, the principles and spirit of MI just dovetail perfectly with vocational rehabilitation. Both are based on client-centered approaches, um, respect for the individual, acceptance, um, empathy, 
There's the emphasis on empowering the individual in informed choice, increasing self-confidence, self-efficacy, self-determination. Uh, VR works often with uh, mandated or, or customers who come in from other systems. They may come to us resistant, not knowing what VR is about, and MI provides skills that helps staff uh, roll with that resistance, decrease it, and explore the uh, ambivalence about going back to work. The Taste Center, um, we also started looking at what journal articles were out there, what evidence um, about the use of MI was already in place. And I happened to uh, find a journal article that described how Washington State VR as an agency um, used motivational interviewing as an intervention. We looked at the lessons learned from them and how they decided to implement MI at all levels of the agency. So the administrators, regional managers, um, VR counselors, supervisors, their rehabilitation technicians, um, benefit counselors, how they incorporated it throughout. So we started becoming very interested in how uh, an MI-oriented um, organizational environment could possibly help with um, better quality employment outcomes, um, help with staff retention, uh, less staff burnout, and more job satisfaction. We also looked at discussing it regionally uh, within Region 5 uh, with our states and also brought in um, Dr. Trevor Manthe, who is a, a MINT trainer. And we took it also to our National Taste Collaborative, um, discussing, hey, let's look at this. We think it's a good fit. What do the rest of you think? Um, we formed a, uh, a national taste collaborative motivational interviewing work group so that we could share best practices and information and be consistent in um, dissemination of training and uh, in order to help affect um, better outcomes with state agencies. Wisconsin uh, Vocational Rehabilitation really got interested in this um, and decided that applying uh, motivational interviewing skills throughout the agency, along with having a, an upfront research and evaluation component, would be a, a great way to affect change uh, within their agency. So that's kind of the background of, of how we got started um, involved in, in this whole project. Next slide. When we looked at what um, counselor behaviors or practices that um, motivational interviewing is, is being used to influence uh, or adapt. We, one of the, the main things that we wanted to uh, see if, if it would happen would be that upfront engagement with consumers. Um, MI is really a way of being with people. Um, and one of the regional managers in Wisconsin had said that as he walked through uh, various um, offices and, and districts, he wanted to hear consumers talking more than counselors. And he was very interested in saying, I think this might be a way of helping to turn that, that uh, practice around. Um, the partnership and collaboration during the entire VR process is another um, practice that we hope is, is going to be enhanced so that it remains um, upfront. Voc Rehab counselors already have a natural ability and a, a desire to help people. They come uh, oftentimes with master's degrees. And motivational interviewing really builds upon those skills that they, they, already, come ha they already have at the job, basic counseling and guidance. And it allows the art counselors to tweak them or, or weave them together uh, that better facilitates employment outcomes. So the use of um, 
strategically using open-ended questions and, and reflections when they're meeting with consumers um, to enhance outcomes. And finally, I, we, we really felt that you know, the foundation of basic vocational rehabilitation is, is critical. The, uh, getting back to basics is a theme and a, a process that we've heard many state agencies um, say that they are focusing on. They've had loss of staff due to retirements. Um, there are state economic factors that have resulted in reduction in staff. So state agencies are, are recognizing that having this strong foundation in place um, by getting back to basics, guidance and counseling, job placement, um, allows the staff to be more effective in serving the most significantly disabled population and really is um, strengthening the adherence to the spirit and the intent of the Rehabilitation Act. Next slide. When we looked at how can we um, adapt motivational interviewing skills into a training curriculum for voc rehab counselors, right up front we realized all examples in, in training have to be applicable to VR. Um, we did a pilot where we tried to um, teach motivational interviewing skills, but we were using examples from the behavioral health um, arena from uh, the start of uh, where MI started with alcoholism and, and drug abuse settings. <clears throat> and people would say, okay, but ha how, show me how this how I can use it in my job. So making sure that we changed it so that all examples, all skill sets were taught using VR settings. Uh, it's not a lecture type training. So the majority of time is spent in small and large group practice. Um, we looked at, you know, it, what should a state agency uh, make it a voluntary training, invite people to come versus mandatory? That's had some effect on uh, how well it's been received. Uh, we also stress that the use of motivational interviewing doesn't replace what a counselor already has. Um, they may have techniques and tools within their toolkit that's been effective for them, and that's great. But this is something that can complement their efforts in helping individuals go back to work. We also made sure that um, we used current case examples and, and had discussion and showing how MI can be applied. Um, the uh, opportunities to problem solve any application barriers within their day-to-day -day work um, and discussing that was very important. We've seen that counselors are receiving motivational interviewing training in new counselor orientation. So it, agencies are looking at incorporating that um, right up front into their culture. Some sustainability methods um, that have been happening so far have been having agency MI coaches, so peers who are available to assist with um, ongoing skill retention, and coaching circles uh, within offices or regions so that staff have access um, to assistance when they need it. They've got supportive supervisors who have abilities to teach and help them utilize uh, motivational interviewing tools. Thank you, Christine. Um, what's exciting about this, in, in, from my perspective, is you have researchers and professional development experts using evidence-based research that recognizes the central role of the VR counselor to vocational rehabilitation outcomes. And it's using motivational interviewing to, that seeks to, ch to adapt the behavior of both the counselor and the consumer of VR services. Now we will look at the application of MI from the perspective of a state agency. 
including how they approach training, how evidence has influenced their investment in training, and how they plan to measure the effectiveness of that investment. Our presenter is JoLynn Blazer, the Staff Development Director of Minnesota VR. JoLynn. Thanks, Jerry. I'm excited to be a part of this um, webinar. I, when I came to the State Folk Rehab Agency in 2006, I came from a training position at our Minnesota Department of Corrections, where motivational interviewing was just being uh, rolled out <clears throat> as an evidence-based practice there for correctional staff. When I walked in the door here, our rehabilitation specialist on mental health and was conducting and involved with a project around individual placement and support uh, for persons with serious mental illness and supported employment. And she walked into my office and said, we have to do training on motivational interviewing. So uh, along with all of the other staff development needs that were here, uh, we took some, we made some starts and stops in trying to identify some resources to help bring motivational interviewing to the state. <clears throat> and then in 2010, we found that we had some additional funding that we could direct toward a larger effort in motivational interviewing. And I think along the way in our exploration process, I hooked up with Washington State VR, who was a bit ahead of us on this journey, <clears throat> and got lots of great advice and consultation with them in terms of what this would take um, in terms of training staff with the, and equipping them with the skills that they needed to really implement motivational interviewing effectively. So we started off uh, considering this from the perspective that this is going to be a long-term commitment. We're going to be in this for the long haul, uh, and we're going to make a significant investment in training and also in integrating sort of um, these skills within our work. <clears throat> We, had a, we set up an implementation team that included myself, uh, our voc rehab field director, uh, our staff development specialist, and a regional manager, a field manager. <clears throat> and we would meet along with uh, our, our local resource. I was finally able to do this, actually, because we identified a local expert who works through our local uh, our state college system who was a motivational interviewing network of trainers, trainers. His name is Bill Payne. And we were able to develop a contract with them. And he had access to a cadre of very skilled trainers in the state of Minnesota who were also part of the motivational interviewing network of trainers group, or what they refer to themselves as, as is Minties. So we <laughs> made a commitment that we were going to use Minties uh, to deliver this training for our staff. So. <clears throat> Bill was also a part of that implementation team and worked with us along the way. We met you know, frequently to say, OK, what are our next steps? Where do we start? How do we start rolling this out? And through that, um, we, were, we offered a variety. We started off with just a basic introductory level training, which was three days. We, um, we did not make it mandatory. We, we allowed it to be voluntary. And we found that many, 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 many of our staff to participate. We have since then uh, created an expectation that it is a requirement for new staff to at least go through one level of motivational interviewing training, an introductory level. But our, our sort of curriculum includes uh, you know, an intro session. We have refresher courses. We've had small group coaching circles where people can practice the skills. We've had um, small group audio taping practice sessions where people can listen to each other's audio tapes and get and give feedback. And people find that that is where the rubber meets the road for them in terms of learning, when they can actually start identifying what they're doing in their consultations with consumers and, uh, and get feedback on it and get direction on how they can take the next step in their learning. And um, uh, kudos to the TACE, five, who is supporting our staff now in being able to do some individual learning uh, processes by uploading audio tapes and getting feedback through one of the uh, vendors that offers audio taping, coding, and feedback services. <clears throat> we also have pretty much uh, invested quite a bit in training our supervisors. In fact, that was our step one before the rollout is we had a full day session with our field managers, introducing them to motivational interviewing so that we would have their support. And we have uh, supported them in whatever 
direction they've wanted to take in deepening their own learning around this. And many of them have been um, applying it and, and trying to use it even in their supervisory practices with staff. I knew from the beginning that we needed to know whether this investment was going to pay off in terms of outcomes and had some initial conversations with the University of Wisconsin um, with Fong Chan and John Louis. Fong is at the University of Medicine, works with Dr. Tansy, and uh, John Louis is with the University of Wisconsin Stout. And we were uh, asking them for some help with helping us figure out how do we evaluate this. Um, and through many discussions now this year, finally, uh, they have rolled out um, a, a research project with us uh, where they're doing a counselor survey and they're going to be looking at some of our case service data, which I'll talk about a little bit further later. Um, but one of the things that we has been a guiding principle for us in rolling out motivational interviewing is this idea that successful implementation requires attention not only to staff training, but to the organizational supports that are around that and to um, our leadership and how our leadership is role modeling it, um, setting expectations, um, involved in the learning and supporting the learning. And what we need, in, and around the organizational supports, what we need to do in terms of changing VR processes to be more consistent with the spirit of motivational interviewing. So we are still in this for the long haul and we're continuing the, the process of learning and, and working our way through helping people to build the skills. At this point, our current focus is building our internal capacity. We have a group of about 15 staff who are um, learning uh, uh, mentoring and coaching skills in motivational interviewing, and that's very exciting because in order to sustain it long term, cost-wise, we have to be able to deliver it internally eventually. So we're on the road there. Next slide. OK, so as I said, uh, our decision to invest in this training was really influenced by a couple of things. Uh, first of all, motivational interviewing was already established as an evidence-based practice in the mental health field in uh, the Individual Placement and Support Model, or IPS. I had also, as I mentioned, had experience with motivational interviewing as an evidence-based practice in corrections, the field of corrections. I also mentioned that um, Washington State Vocational Rehabilitation Program provided significant guidance to us in, um, in finding out how it was impacting their services and making the decision to, to go forward. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Evidence-Based Practice in Voc Rehab is conducting research with us right now. They've conducted a counselor survey and will be working uh, in the next month or so on analyzing case performance data. It's going to be based on um, levels of training that staff have had. So we're going to be looking at uh, the differences in case service elements for uh, counselors who have had more training versus less training to see if there's any specific impact on how um, on the outcomes or the, the process for the consumer. Most of the data that we have right now is really anecdotal data from our staff. And it really uh, gets me excited when I have staff call or email me and say, I have done, I've, I've attempted to use my motivational interviewing skills in this situation, and wow, you wouldn't believe the outcome. Mostly they're ta the staff are talking about they have a much greater understanding of the individual consumer and where they're coming from, what their barriers and goals are, and, and they're better able to work the plan with the individual and, and support the client with their, with their goals and their plans for employment. They also state that there's a lot much stronger participation in the planning process and developing plans more quickly. One of the stories I heard from one of our staff was about a student she'd been working with who had cognitive and physical disabilities uh, due to cerebral palsy. And she had the impression from her previous work with him that he was nonverbal, that he didn't really uh, have high intellect. And as she was meeting with him again at the beginning of the school year, she thought, ah, I'm going to stop and I'm going to try to use my motivational interviewing skills with this guy. And she said, as I, I sat there in awe as this quiet student starts to completely open up, I ended up not only identifying issues and confidences that we obviously have to work on throughout the year, I found out where he was at in his thoughts about his graduation. I realized I was completely wrong about this guy. He's really smart very intuitive, has no problem talking, even with speech, um, speech impairment. And as I keep my mouth shut for a change and I listen to him at the very end of 
the interview through tears, he starts to re reveal a, a story of personal grief and loss. And at the end of the interview, she said, we knew that our counseling relationship had changed forever, and my counseling techniques had too. So it's very exciting to hear those kinds of outcomes, the real, the real life kind of outcomes that are that are happening for our clients. Thank you, Jolyn. Um, your 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 discussion really points to me the importance of research on vocational rehabilitation service delivery. One thing I really pulled from your comments was that it was the rigor of research about motivational interviewing that led, was a critical factor in the reasons behind the investment in MI by the VR agency. So research about service delivery is critical to the decision-making processes that go on in the VR system. I think the field will also benefit greatly from your ongoing evaluation, and we look forward to hearing about that. Now let us hear from a VR counselor. Our presenter is Kay Lechner from Wisconsin Vocational Rehabilitation, who will discuss how the use of MI has changed the interaction between VR counselors and consumers, and she will discuss some examples of how MI is improving service delivery outcomes. Kay? Thank you. I've been using MI approaches in my work with consumers um, since starting the basic training, um, and I've been using it as a tool to build on um, the counseling skills that I had from graduate school. Um, I really enjoyed, as part of our training, that we had the opportunity to practice so much. Um, and so I was able to kind of hit the ground running and then have training to build on that, um, including the advanced training. Um, so I'm, of course, using MI in my in-person meetings with consumers. So through every step of our process, when I'm meeting with consumers in person, I'm trying to at least incorporate some of my MI techniques as part of our meeting, not always possible to to do strictly MI throughout the entire meeting. Um, but some examples would include the intake meeting. Um, so JoLynn had shared an example from a counselor in Minnesota um, with getting the person to open up. I found that to be my experience as well, getting to hear about the person's disability, hear what they're hoping to um, have DVR help with, and things like that. I'm also using it um, if someone's on our waiting list and they're calling me to check in, I'm able to pretty quickly um, dispel some of their resistance or kind of um, calm them down from some anger they might be experiencing and then provide some information about our waiting list. Then when people come off of our waiting list and are activated, um, I'm using MI, of course, to start clarifying goals and agendas, um, building their motivation, um, and, and talk again about DVR, make sure that we're on the same page and that I fully understand their goals, and then we can move forward from there. And then as we get closer to the end of a case, um, when we're actively working to meet those goals. We're sometimes cycling back through if the person's hitting resistance again. Um, we're just using all, all parts of motivational interviewing to help the person continue moving forward um, and also helping the person decide how they would like their case to end. So sometimes that's a successful case closure. Sometimes, unfortunately, it may be unsuccessful, but it's really, in my eyes, successful if the person has been able to make his or her own decision about the case. Um, I've also found MI um, to be very useful during phone calls. So Tim mentioned earlier that MI can be very effective in just a brief setting or a brief interaction. And that's a, a really good point um, that we can use MI in phone calls. I, I do that all the time um, just to get someone calmed down, figure out what's going on, and, and help problem solve it, um, making sure that we're both on the same page. Um, it seems like pretty quickly I can kind of cut through things and the person can feel just over the phone that I really understand where they're coming from. Next slide. I think MI can change interactions between counselors and consumers, um, especially in my own work when I compare using MI to any other techniques I may have or, you know, not using any structured technique. Um, I've found that it has a really positive effect when I'm using motivational interviewing. Um, my interactions with consumers seem to be more calm. 
so the consumer is pretty quickly able to come down um, from any anger they might be having or any confusion or anxiety. Um, they feel less defensive, um, seem to be just more comfortable talking once we get started. Um, also, the interactions are, as they should be, consumer-focused. Um, so instead of the consumer feeling like, wow, this counselor is just asking me question after question and I'm getting interrogated, um, the counselor is talking less, asking fewer questions, but asking them strategically when needed, um, and then really eliciting a lot of information from the consumer, which then makes the interactions more collaborative. So once we elicit that information from the consumer, um, then the consumer is in the driver's seat and we're strategically using using the information that we've gained um, to really plan out the process um, and move forward. So to me, it just seems like the interaction is changing from being a little bit chaotic at times if we don't have specific techniques that we're using um, or if we have less effective techniques. Um, it seems like to me it just becomes kind of a, a well-conducted duet, so to speak, and the consumer is leading the melody and then the counselor is there to help provide some of the resources and provide backup um, for the direction the consumer has chosen to move in. Next slide. And I have just a couple of examples that I'd like to share from my work. Um, the first is with a case closure. Um, this was a consumer that had numerous physical disabilities, which seemed to be getting progressively worse um, despite the medical attention that he was receiving. Um, the consumer and his guardian um, had both met with me several times as we had moved through the case. Um, the consumer had chosen to participate in two temporary work experiences to try out employment um, and re-enter the workforce. And we met throughout this, and after the second work experience, we had a staffing meeting. Um, and the work experience had not gone well due to these physical disabilities um, that were just getting, um, the consumer was in more pain, um, struggling more to work. And he shared about that in our meeting. And um, so then I was able to present some options after listening carefully to his experience of re-entering the workforce in these two different work experiences and we were comparing them. And when I presented him the options, he was able to make with his guardian, um, actually they were both on the same page, um, they were both able to choose that they wanted to have the case closed. Um, and they weren't very happy about him not being able to work, but I could tell that they were relaxed by being able to make their own decision. Um, and they felt calm with, um, and just you could see that on their faces, that they just felt really calm about moving forward. Um, they weren't happy about it, but they knew that that was the choice that they wanted to make. Um, and so that was not a successful case in terms of um, Wisconsin DVR numbers and things like that, um, but really I felt like I had left the choice up to them. Um, and so I know that, you know, that's their decision and then they've got the information about using DVR again in the future if they would choose. And I have another consumer um, that I'd like to share as an example. Um, this individual is a young lady and um, she came to DVR with anxiety and also with a learning disability. Um, and from the very beginning of her case after she came off the waiting list, I wasn't finding her to be engaged, which was really um, her own ambivalence kind of manifesting itself in lack of follow through. So she wasn't calling me back, wasn't emailing me, and when I finally got her in for a meeting, um, I was really ready to use my MI skills, and I did, and so we explored everything. We were really spending a lot of time focusing and clarifying where she wanted to head. Um, she was confused about a lot of things with DVR, so I helped clarify that, and all of a sudden she was opening up, um, and before I knew it, she was saying, well, Kate, you know what I think I could do? And then she was laying out some steps. Um, that she wanted to take. And just before my eyes, I couldn't believe it. So um, she's been engaged ever since um, with a few ups and downs, of course, which are normal. So I'm sticking with her and um, we're moving right along. So her case, um, we don't know the outcome yet, 
um, what the outcome of that will be, but just the fact that she's been more engaged with me and she's created her own plan for her future um, is really something that we should take note of. Good. Thank you all very much. Um, and thank you for your presentations. What I'd like to do now is to pivot a little bit and then look at this discussion in context. Our previous webinar focused on the potential application of practice guidelines in vocational rehabilitation service delivery. Let us, let's pick up that discussion here with today's panel. And I want to turn to our presenters. Would practice guidelines be helpful in deepening and defining the application of motivational interviewing to VR service delivery? Tim, why don't you start? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, it, uh, certainly, I, I think practice guidelines, um, and specific to even man manualized training, is critical, I, I think, for looking at uh, improving the overall application of, of motivational interviewing in vocational rehabilitation services. Uh, manualized training, um, particularly in specific interventions, are recommended uh, because it does a couple of things. It, it helps to increase the understanding of the techniques and the process and the part of the counselors administering that technique. And it gives them a greater awareness of, of why certain things are done and why certain features of, of that theory or of that application are important. It also helps with overall fidelity to that empirically validated use of motivational interviewing. Uh, one of the difficulties, I think, in, in research to practice over time is that you may have a, a, something that works well within a research circumstance, but translating that into practice, um, it doesn't always hold up to or have the same level of benefit that was found in the original research. And by utilizing some type of manualized training, you can get that greater level of fidelity so that what was observed in a research setting can then be also hopefully observed in that practice setting, at least uh, that there would be fewer confounds with variation in the actual application of that theory or that treatment. It's kind of a likewise thing that the RTC and evidence-based practice is working on is, is a specific counselor toolkit. And the concept behind a counselor toolkit is, is to look at what assessments are actually being utilized in uh, state VR services, look at other ones that we believe have a certain amount of, of support within the literature and within practice for their use, and ultimately training counselors on, on what those actual assessments are, and then how to select from, again, those manualized trained focus of, of motivational interviewing, how to select specific motivational interviewing interventions based on what those assessments are telling the counselor. And again, this is uh, looking at that uh, movement from evidence basis to practice. Uh, trying to join those two, that the, again, the, the collaborative model between the researchers and the practitioners, that we can identify what we know works and what, we, you know, what is known about certain uh, needs of an individual, and ultimately give the counselor, I think, the tools and the know-how to step in and utilize the wonderfully trained interventions to be able to meet those needs of the individual, again, towards improving overall uh, vocational rehabilitation outcomes, improving working alliance, and ultimately improving uh, client satisfaction with services. Thank you, Tim. Now let us hear from our panelists from state VR agencies. JoLynn, Kay? Yeah, I think that practice guidelines are needed, um, in, particular, like, in particular for modifying the application of motivational interviewing when uh, counselors are working with consumers with specific types of disabilities where standard MI approaches might not be uh, the most uh, efficient way of working with a person. For example, uh, in working with a person with a developmental disability, you may need to uh, do more of uh, more concrete type reflections than sort of metaphorical kinds of reflections that you might do with someone who had <clears throat> was able to grasp metaphors more effectively. The, the motivational interviewing in the treatment of his psychological problems has a chart in it where um, it identifies specific things how you would specifically adapt the use of some of the basic strategies of motivational interviewing um, with people with severe mental illness, depending on their clinical presentation. Okay. 
Yes, and I would agree. I think practice guidelines um, will be very helpful having um, some extra structure building on what we already have about motivational interviewing, building on what we already know. Um, the VR process has so much structure that's inherent to it um, through the flow, the way we move cases along. And I think if we can um, use the structure of the VR process and add MI into that with the practice guidelines for counselors to make it very clear about how to use it. Of course, there's flexibility and there's counselor differences and those kinds of things, and there's always room for that. Um, but if we can give counselors who like more structure, um, if we can give them the structure of how to implement this, then I think it um, will really grow and take off um, because counselors will feel more comfortable and confident using it, having those practice guidelines to follow. Thank you very much. Now that we've talked about how research on motivational interviewing has influenced VR practices, what other examples are there where research on other topics has influenced or should influence VR practice? Again, let us begin with the perspective of the researcher on our panel, Tim. When we look at research that's going on and, and, and that really is influencing or adapting the practice of, of VR counselors, I think the, 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 the important statement to make is that when we consider true evidence-based practices, uh, practices that really do have a, uh, not only a fair amount of anecdotal or descriptive research, but all the way up to broad-scale utilization, randomized control design, um, really those type of practices are in their infancy in VR services. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of promising practices, and I, I want to you know, clarify, promising practices are those that are likely going to be found to be evidence-based and ones that should be widely disseminated. There are many promising practices that are going on that do have some initial empirical support, things such as looking at motivational interviewing and, and how that can ultimately impact and improve the overall service provision and experience of persons with disabilities in the state VR system. But these need a, a much greater level of, of you know, first of all, clarification of when we say, you know, one practice and motivational interviewing in one state to another state, are we talking about comparable practices and then ultimately how those practices can be evaluated kind of on a, an apples-to-apples -apples, uh, type platform. I think other practices that are coming, uh, I would call promising practices at this point, that I do think are, are certainly having an impact on the practice of v, by VR counselors are things such as work incentive planning or benefits counseling, as it's also been described. Uh, I think this you know, clearly is giving you know, uh, individuals who may have uh, motivations maybe to uh, forego active work or working uh, with their VR counselor. There's certainly uh, some emerging evidence that suggests this is, a, again, a, a wonderful practice if implemented properly. I think States are, are moving and very quickly looking at things such as program evaluation of specific services. Um, as JoLynn has mentioned, uh, the joint project between the state of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin, uh, I think looking at you know, the utilization of a specific service and then ultimately what is the impact of that service on things such as time to closure uh, are, are going to be important to give us some sense of, of how we can really tailor the experience of the individual and how we train counselors to utilize those type of services to result in, I think, that optimal outcome. Um, I think we are seeing more states get involved in, in looking at motivational interviewing as a way to engage the clients that are, that are requesting services. I would definitely say Minnesota and Wisconsin are, are leaders in this area as far as their adoption of MI principles and techniques providing broad training for rehabilitation counselors uh, in motivational interviewing, and really, uh, again, I think adapting their service models to make it uh, possible to actually incorporate motivational interviewing as part of that practice. I think if, you know, I, I think the, the, my best statement would be, is, is, or at least reflection, is to defer people to the executive summary on an intensive case study done by the RRTC, RRTC on evidence-based practice. And the website's listed there, but this really, I think, highlights uh, at least four different states that uh, I think overall uh, are experiencing uh, you know, good overall case closure numbers within a broad variety of different uh, uh, populations of persons with disabilities. And really lays out, again, what we found from what we truly could call an evidence-based practices 
these promising practices and how those practices will actually impact service provision, and then ultimately how state agencies can be supportive of these emerging practices. Thank you, Tim. Um, Joe Lynn, other examples where research has or should influence VR practices? You know, I've mentioned earlier the individual placement and support model for supported employment. Minnesota was part of the Dartmouth study uh, on that. Uh, it was a demonstration project for that, and we recently received additional funds to expand that model. So our counselors are currently being trained. Uh, we're trying to expand that model to additional states in the state. And I think that is a great example where there has been research into the, the best practices around supported employment for people with severe mental illness and it is take, it's beginning to take hold more firmly within our system. Two of the sort of more promising practices that we've had the opportunity to be involved with or will be, will be involved with, um, most recently we were working with a NIDER field initiated project run by um, the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University and the University of Utah on clinical supervision. And so we've had the opportunity to be a part of that research our, our, uh, our field managers all had the opportunity to participate in clinical supervision training, which is relatively new for a relatively new concept, I think, for vocational rehabilitation supervisors. Much of their work has been administrative in nature, and we're now talking about sort of the more clinical aspects of supervision that they might be able to provide for counselors, which dovetails nicely with the approach of motivational interviewing. And then the second one is we're just starting to be involved with some research with um, <clears throat> the Institute on Community Integration at the University of Massachusetts and Mathematica Policy Research Institute uh, to, on a model demonstration project on how to increase employment outcomes for SSDI recipients. Great. Um, Christine from TACE 5 or Kay, our counselor? Um, I think. Um, Two other areas where research has influenced um, uh, VR practice has been in the uh, service delivery to uh, individuals with traumatic brain injury. So um, research has shown that an integrated team approach, um, making sure that there's cognitive skills training, uh, that the use of um, assistive technology and is, is incorporated, um, making sure the consumer has that training in the use of AT. Uh, it's also shown that uh, on VR's uh, side that providing on-the-job training, the counseling and guidance, um, and job placement services have increased outcomes for this population. And um, I really, there's a lot that's being done with this population. And again, the evidence-based um, research is helping to improve outcomes. and. Another um, area is in working with transition age youth. So the, the guidelines that have been developed and best practices, um, having a, a seamless transition from school to work, uh, the strong partnerships uh, between VR, uh, the schools, and the community providers. Um, one of the other big things is having paid work experiences, uh, usually in the summer, uh, family involvement, youth leadership. So these are some areas where research has um, really influenced VR practice and service delivery. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, that concludes our discussion today. And I want to thank you all very much um, and thank all of our discussants. We hope that the people listening to the webcast found this session to be informative. I want to remind them to, that today's event was the second in a series of webcasts on knowledge translation from vocational rehabilitation research to service delivery. Also, we intend that these webcasts will foster the creation of a community of practice where there's dialogue among researchers, educators, practitioners, policymakers, and other stakeholders can continue to inform and serve those dedicated to vocational rehabilitation and its goals. Cindy, do you have any last words? Thanks so much, Jerry, and our presenters today. To stimulate more discussion, we invite listeners to contact us to provide your input on today's webcast, share your thoughts on future webcast topics, and participate in our community of practice to continue the dialogue. We'd like to hear from you. 
because your views can inform and shape our future work. You can contact us at the email address shown on the screen, ktdrr at sedl.org. Thanks all. Thank you, Cindy. We also have a brief evaluation form and would appreciate your input about the webcast today. The link is on the last page of the PowerPoint file, and everyone who registered will also get an email with the link to the evaluation form. Cindy, let me thank you and the presenters today for your contributions. We appreciate everyone's input. And um, thank you, and have a good day.